All right, folks, we're going to be in our Bible study tonight in 2 Samuel. So if you want to take your Bibles and go to 2 Samuel, we left off last week, chapters 16 and 17. So while you're finding your place there in chapter 18, I'm going to just quickly put up for you the points from last week's study. If you weren't here, we tried to take some principles away from each of these chapters from chapter 16. We noted, be sure to investigate both sides of a story. That's Proverbs 8, 17. Number two, critics may criticize, haters may hate, but the Lord is our defender, amen. And number three, never trust advice that dishonors God. Then into chapter 17, we, we uh, gleaned these principles. Number one, the Lord can deal with our adversaries better than we can. Our job is to pray. And number two, when we are weary in the wilderness, God is faithful to bring along just the right people to encourage us. So this is where we left off. This particular time in Israel's history, uh, David is king. Um, but there is chaos in the kingdom. There's chaos in the kingdom because there's chaos in David's family. As a result of his affair with Bathsheba, though he was repentant, though he cried out for the mercy of God and received God's mercy and forgiveness, there were consequences to bear. Sometimes we forget that. We think that after we sin and we ask God to forgive us, everything is made right. Well, everything's made right between us and the Lord, but there's still some fallout sometimes from our sinful choices. In David's case, the fallout was this. The prophet Nathan said to him, because you've disobeyed the Lord and you've done what you've done, the sword shall not depart from your family. In other words, there will be strife and chaos. There will be a lot of turmoil and trouble in your own household. And one of the things we saw was that one of David's uh, sons um, uh, uh, raped uh, David's daughter, a half uh, daughter, a half uh, sister rather. Um, and so Absalom wanted to rescue the dignity and the reputation of his sister Tamar. So he takes matters into his own hand and Absalom uh, kills uh, Adonijah and, um, and thus there is, uh, sorry, Amnon. He kills Amnon uh, for raping Amnon's half-sister Tamar. And after Absalom does that, um, there is just further strife in the family. And now Absalom has returned to Jerusalem after being away, after killing his half-brother Amnon and he tries to take his father's throne. And so he is a threat to the kingdom. And instead of fighting, David decides he's just gonna basically relinquish Jerusalem to his son. He would rather just leave than fight his son. So Absalom comes into the palace in Jerusalem and David and his servants and many people with David flee. And David goes over the Mount of Olives and he ends up in a place called Mahonaim, which is about 65 miles northeast of Jerusalem on the other side of the Jordan River. So on a map today, it would be in the country of Jordan. And there he is just waiting and trusting the Lord. Lord, if you wanna uh, redeem my reign as king, then you can do that. If you're done with me, then you can do that. And so he waits and Absalom mounts uh, an army. Absalom, his son, mounts uh, this, this coup against his father's reign. And um, one of the people that he recruits into his, into his coup is uh, Ahithophel, one of David's closest friends and advisors, who happens to be also the grandfather of Bathsheba. And, and so now there is about to be literal war between the house of Absalom and the house of David. And Absalom with his army is uh, seeking where David is. And David now has his army and uh, there's gonna be war. Well, in chapter 18, verse one, it says, and David numbered the people who were with him and set captains of thousands and captains of hundreds over them. And then David sent out one third of the people under the hand of Joab, one hand under the hand of Abishai, the son of Zariah, Joab's brother, and one third under the hand of Ittai, the Gittite. And the king said to the people, I also will surely go out with you myself. Father, we commit our Bible study to you now and pray that as we open up our Bibles and look here into chapter 18, that you would speak to us tonight. Thank you, Lord, for meeting us here. Thank you for those watching online. We commit this to you, Lord. Speak to us now through the timeless truth of your word. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 
And so here David is, he is in a position where he wants to defend himself. He doesn't really want to fight his, his son. His son is pursuing him under the advice, the bad advice of Ahithophel. And, and so he decides, I'm going to take out my dad and once and for all take the throne from my dad. And uh, David uh, gathers together his own army and he organizes them into three divisions. And he gives Joab one of the divisions, he gives uh, Abishai another division, and he gives uh, Ittai a third division. And then David inspects the troops, and he says there in verse 2, I also will surely go out with you myself. David's ready to go into battle. Now, it was customary in those days that the leader would be in the front of the battle. Even today in Israel, generals fight with, uh, with the, um, uh, the infantry uh, on the battlefield. And, and they are not, you know, somewhere secluded. They are there right on the battlefield. And David says, I'm going to fight with you. Now, why is he so eager to go with them? I think it's because he's learning from his mistake in 2 Samuel chapter 11. It says, at a time when kings go to war, David was in the palace. And David was in the palace, and that's when he had the affair with Bathsheba. So he should have been at war. Instead, he was at home. And when he was at home and alone, that's when temptation gripped his heart, and he ended up having the affair with Bathsheba. So I think this is David's way of saying, not going to do that again. I'm going to go to battle like kings are supposed to do. And I think it's an important point for us to remember here from chapter 18. Number one, don't repeat the past, learn from it. David didn't want to repeat the past, he wanted to learn from his past. And he realized I should have been at war back in chapter 11. That's when temptation gripped my heart. I ended up sleeping with Bathsheba. So I'm going to go out with the troops and I'm going to fight with them. Well, the people didn't want him to go, though. And say, they said in verse 3, you shall not go out, for if we flee away, they will not care about us, nor if half of us die, will they care about us. But you are worth 10,000 of us now, for you are now more help to us in the city. So the people actually plead with him, don't go, don't fight. You know, you're, you're still king. You have much more value than we do. And Absalom might kill us and he won't care. But you're too valuable. Don't go out to battle. And so it says in verse for that the king said to them, whatever seems best to you, I will do. And so it, he doesn't go because he's afraid of going or he's going to repeat his, his previous mistakes. He ends up taking counsel and he realizes, you know what, if I'm of greater value to be with the people, I'll stay with the people. And so he hangs back and it says there that so the king stood beside the gate and all the people went out by hundreds and by thousands. So there he is by the gate. He's in Mahanaim. He's not in Jerusalem. He's inspecting the troops. They're marching out and he's giving them, you know, a little bit of motivation. He's giving them um, a little bit of encouragement as they go. And it says in verse five, now the king had commanded Joab, Abishai and Ittai saying, do Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And so notice there, David didn't say, you know, for Absalom's sake. He said, for my sake. Like, if you have a relationship with me and you love me, please don't kill my son. Please bring him back alive. And it says there, and all the people heard when the king gave all the captains orders concerning Absalom. David wanted all of them to hear. His heart was for his son, even though there was, there was an estranged relationship between father and son now, years had gone by, there was some bitterness, there was turmoil, there was division in the household. David said, I don't want my son to die, so please bring him back alive. And he said it loudly enough so that everybody heard the heart of the king, please bring my son back alive. So verse 5 says, and rather, verse 6 says, And so the people went out into the field of battle against Israel, and the battle was in the woods of Ephraim. Now notice the people, that means those with David, went out into the field of battle against Israel. That is a reference to those who were with Absalom. The battle was in the woods of Ephraim, and it says the people of Israel were overthrown there before the servants of David, and a great slaughter, imagine this, of 20,000 took place there that day. This, this, is, this is terrible. 20,000, try to imagine 20,000 bodies strewn across the landscape. Da dead, verse 8, for the battle there was scattered over the face of the whole countryside, and the woods devoured more that day than the sword devoured. What in the world does that mean? The woods devoured 
more people that day than the sword devoured. Here's what it means. It speaks about how God intervened. What, it, what it's referring to is the fact that God, through these unusual ways in the woods, killed more people than the sword. So through them falling into pits or God unleashing wild beasts in, in the woods or swamps, you know, different commentaries you read, they speculate, well, how did the woods kill all these people? Well, we don't really know, except this is a reference to the fact that God intervened. And it's a good reminder to us, for you note takers, number two, that God helps us in our battles in unusual ways. There were people who were dying in this battle because God intervened. And that's why this verse says what it does, that the woods devoured more people than the sword did because God stepped in and they died in the woods. And maybe people didn't know how they died, but they died. And God intervened to do that. And that's how he will often work in our lives. There are times in our lives where God will intervene and God will fight for us and do things for us in unusual ways. And we will often get through it and realize, you know, I think God stepped in and intervened in some way. And God does what he does on behalf of his children whom he loves. And it says then, verse 9, then Absalom met the servants of David. Now, that literally means Absalom was overtaken by the servants of David. Absalom rode on a mule. The mule went under the thick boughs of a great terebinth tree. And his head caught in the terebinth. And so he was left hanging between heaven and earth, and the mule which was under him went on. Now a certain man saw it and told Joab and said, I just saw Absalom hanging in a terebinth tree. Now we, I got to stop here. We have to have a principle out of this, right? So, so uh, this is number three for you. Stay off mules and out of branches. <laughs> That's actually a joke. I don't really mean that. I was actually trying to be clever and think, you know, like, like a Chinese like fortune cookie, you know, uh, man, in, man with head in branches cannot get ahead. You know, something like that. Uh, but actually what I decided on was to be a little bit more serious, and that is that God opposes a rebellious spirit, because that's what Absalom had here. He had a rebellious spirit. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, the Bible says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And God was dealing with Absalom because of his rebellion. And so here he is on a mule. Now that, that's not very prestigious, is it? You're, you're, you know, you're, you're the self-proclaimed king and you're riding a mule? You know, couldn't you have found a horse somewhere in the kingdom? So he's riding a mule, and he's riding through the forest. The terebinth tree are like oaks with low-hanging branches that, um, that was easy. If you're on a mule and you're obviously up higher, easy for you to get caught in the branches if you're not ducking. Now, a lot of people believe, and this is possible, a lot of people believe if you remember back in chapter 14, it described Absalom as a very handsome man with long flowing hair. And that once, a, this is just the description in chapter 14, and that once a year Absalom would cut his hair and weigh it. And in modern terms, it would weigh about five and a half pounds. So he had a lot of hair. So just think, you know, black raven hair. He's of uh, this Israelite and so a lot of people think as he's riding on the mule that his hair gets tangled in the branches of the tree, and that's possible. Yeah, that much hair that when you cut it off once a year, it weighs five and a half pounds. I mean, that's, that's liable to get caught in something. But it doesn't actually say that. It just says that his head got caught in the branches. Now, I, I actually, somebody sent me this wild picture off of social media that somebody had taken. Um, of a buck that actually must have been running full speed through the forest somewhere and got his head stuck in the V of a tree and couldn't get himself loose with his antlers. And so he ended up dying. It's just this picture of this buck, you know, in between his head, in between the, the V of, of the trunk of a tree. So 
that could have been the kind of thing that happens here. Maybe his, as the mule is going along, his whole head gets lodged and he's hanging here. He's suspended. Now, he hasn't, he hasn't died yet, but he's under great duress, obviously, here hanging between. And, and the, the language is interesting, the way it reads here. So he was left hanging between heaven and earth. And, and I read one commentary on this where it says that both heaven and earth had rejected Absalom. And so he's hanging between both. You know, he, he, what he was doing on earth wasn't right. And he's not right with God. And he's just kind of suspended between both. It's kind of a, a picture of his life. He's, he's not doing what's right on earth. He's not right with God. And he's suspended between heaven and earth. And here he is hanging, whether it's by his hair or by his head, one or the other, but it literally says his head caught in the terebinth. It doesn't mention his hair, but nevertheless, this is obviously a very precarious situation. And this one guy reports to Joab. Now, Joab is the commander of David's army. He says, hey, by the way, I just saw Absalom hanging in a terebinth tree. And Joab, verse, verse 11, Joab said to the man who told him, you just saw him? And why did you not strike him there to the ground? I would have given you 10 shekels of silver and a belt. That doesn't seem like much to us, but in that day, that was a big deal. Now think about what Joab is saying to this guy. It's like, why didn't you kill him? You had a chance to kill him. You saw him hanging from a tree and he's still alive. Why didn't you kill him? Now what did David ask? David asked, as Joab was leading the army out, don't let any harm come for my sake to my son Absalom. And here, Joab, first opportunity, is ready to kill Absalom. It says to the guy, why didn't you kill him? Now notice the guy, the guy was more noble here. The man said to Joab, verse 12, though I were to receive a thousand shekels of silver in my hand, I would not raise my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing, the king commanded you and Abishai and Ittai saying, beware, lest anyone touch the young man Absalom. Otherwise, I would have dealt falsely against my own life, for there is nothing hidden from the king, and you yourself would have set yourself against me. So this guy is of more noble character than Joab. Now look, Joab has a long history with David, and he's very loyal to David. But Joab is also kind of rogue. He's kind of a loose cannon, and he's deciding he's going to disobey a direct order from his commanding officer, and he's going to take matters into his own hands here. And look what happens. Verse 14, then Joab said, I cannot linger with you. And he took three spears in his hand and thrust them through Absalom's heart while he was still alive in the midst of the terebinth tree. And ten young men who bore Joab's armor surrounded Absalom and struck and killed him. So think about this. Joab is the commander of the army, but David is still king, and Joab is defying a direct order from his commanding officer, from the king. And why is he like this? Well, you know, you could maybe come up with a lot of reasons, but I'll tell you one reason why I think when you look at the story and the history of between Joab and David that it might be like this, is because when David committed his affair with Bathsheba, and then he tried to cover up the affair by having her husband brought off the battlefield. And why don't you go sleep with your wife so that the pregnancy and everything would look like it happened through Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba. And then Uriah, though, being a loyal soldier, is like, I, I can't go in and sleep with my wife while my brothers are on the battlefield. So I'm just going to sleep here at the door. I'm not even going to go into to my house. And David's like, oh, this, this plan isn't working. Okay, go back to battle. And David, who does David tell to put Uriah on the front line so that Uriah might be killed? The answer is Joab. David says to Joab as the commander of the army, hey, put Uriah. He sends a message to Joab, put Uriah in the front line of the army. And Joab's like, why? He's like, well, just put him there, just put him there. So that Uriah would die in battle. And then, and then David could think to himself, oh, now coast is clear and I can be this, you know, charming knight in shining armor to rescue the damsel in distress. And when I go and take Bathsheba as my wife, everything will be covered up 
and covered over. And Joab was the guy who had to put Uriah on the front line that he might die. And Joab did that because he's loyal to his commanding officer. But I think that kind of thing just started to brew within Joab. And he realized, you know, I, I've been covering for you, David. And, you know, I covered for your affair and I, and I put Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba, on the front line. And, and I'm tired of doing your dirty work. So he's not as loyal in this sense to David. And when Absalom here is hanging in the tree, Joab just decides, you know what? With all due respect to what David wanted, you know, I'm going to take matters into my own hands now. And, and I'm going to put an end to all of this. And he, I'm not saying it's right. I'm not, I'm not condoning what he does here, but I'm trying to give us some insight into why Joab is going a little rogue here. Because you're going to see later, I don't know if we'll get to it tonight, but Joab has this conversation with David that would, under normal circumstances, have resulted in his death. He kind of, he talks to David in such a disrespectful way. You can just see he's already kind of resigned himself to the fact that this friendship is not what it once was. And in fact, spoiler alert, but David eventually will say to his son Solomon, and Solomon will succeed David as the next king of Israel. You need to deal with Joab after I'm dead. And Solomon will end up having Joab killed because this disloyalty is starting to surface. And I think the root of it is because Joab was tired of doing David's dirty work. And so he just kind of goes out on his own and he does what he does here. And 10 other soldiers under Joab's division end up killing off Absalom. And so verse 15 says, so Joab blew the trumpet. That means, hey, the end of the war. Joab blew the trumpet and the people returned from pursuing Israel for Joab held back the people and they took Absalom and cast him into a large pit in the woods and laid a very large heap of stones over him. And then all Israel fled, everyone to his tent. So in other words, Absalom's army was in full retreat. Because at this point, when Absalom is dead and Joab is blowing the trumpet like there's been victory here, then all of Absalom's army starts to retreat and they pull away and everyone to his tent. And it says, now Absalom, verse 18, in his lifetime had taken and set up a pillar for himself, which is in the king's valley. For he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. And he called the pillar after his own name. And to this day, it is called Absalom's monument. So Absalom, you know, in his own pride, decides to set up a statue in his own honor in what is uh, referred to as the King's Valley. Now, the King's Valley is also known as the Kidron Valley. And today there is a tomb, the tomb of Absalom is in the Kidron Valley. And so he had set up some statue and that's where he is buried uh, today. But notice he says there, for I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. Well, back actually in chapter 14, verse 27, it says that Absalom had three sons. So what we can surmise from that statement is that his sons must have died in battle. And Absalom says, I have no heir. And so he makes this pillar to himself, and that's where he ends up being buried as well. So this is a very tragic end. I mean, there's so much tragedy in David's family uh, of all that is happening here with Amnon and Tamar and Absalom. And well, it says in verse 19, then Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, Zadok was the priest, said, let me run now and take the news to the king, how the Lord has avenged him of his enemies. And Joab said to him, you shall not take the news this day, for you shall take the news another day. But today you shall take no news because the king's son is dead. Now, I can't, I can't tell whether Joab is like, let's be respectful. We don't want to, you know, alarm David uh, prematurely. Or whether Joab is like, don't tell him that I killed him. You know, don't tell him. Uh, but, but he says, we'll do this another day. And then Joab said to the Cushite, go tell the king what you have seen. And so the Cushite bowed himself to Joab and ran. Uh, uh, Cush, the country of Cush is today on a map, part of Sudan and Ethiopia. So this is an unnamed guy, he's a Cushite. And Joab says to him, you go ahead and you take the news. And to Ahamaz, he says, no, don't, I don't want you taking the news. We're going to send this guy. 
But it says in verse 22, And Ahimaaz the son of Zadok said again to Joab, But whatever happens, please let me also run after the Cushite. And Joab said, Why will you run, my son, since you have no news ready? But whatever happens, he said, Let me run. And so he said to him, Run then. And then Ahimaaz ran by way of the plain and outran the Cushite. This is interesting details the Bible gives us. It's like, do we really need to know the foot race? But, you know, God says, yes, you do. And so Ahimaaz, fast runner, you know, he's, he's pulling a 4.2 in the 40 yard at the combine. And, and he's like, and he's outrunning the Cushite. And, and so verse uh, 24, now David was sitting between the two gates and the watchman went up to the roof over the gate to the wall, lifted his eyes and looked. And there was a man running alone. And then the watchman cried out and told the king, and the king said, if he is alone, there is news in his mouth, and he came rapidly and drew near. Now, what he's thinking is, if the whole army was retreating, that would be bad news. The fact that we only see one guy running, this is good news. Verse 26, then the watchman saw another man running, and the watchman called to the gatekeeper and said, there's another man running alone. And the king said, he also brings good news. That's the assumption. And so the watchman said, I think the running of the first is like the running of Ahamaz, the son of Zadok. I wonder what, how he ran that he was like recognized from a distance. Maybe it was just that fast, like a gazelle, or maybe the way that he was, you know, his motions was like, that guy runs kind of funny. That must be Ahamaz. <laughs> Whatever the deal is, the Bible's giving us this details. And the messenger says, wait a minute, I thought there was only one. Now there's a second one. And then both of them are running like a race. And, and they're both by themselves. And so I wonder what's going on here. And so, and the king said, he is a good man and comes with good news. And so verse, verse 28, so Ahamaz called out and said to the king, all is well. Not really. And then he bowed down with his face to the earth before the king and said, Blessed be the Lord your God who has delivered up the men who raised their hand against my Lord the king. Okay, so the coup is over, but the king said, Is the young man Absalom safe? The first thing on the father's mouth, because he's concerned about his son. Ahamaz answered, this is his answer. When Joab sent the king's servant and me your servant, I saw a great tumult, but I did not know what it was about. And the king said, turn aside and stand here. And so he turned aside and stood still. That's, that's because, you see, the other runner, the Cushite, is coming in behind Ahamaz. And David's like, okay, wait, you don't seem to know the answer to my question. Stand here for just a minute. I'm not done with you. I want to find out what this guy has to say. And just then the Cushite came and the Cushite said, there is good news, my lord, the king, for the Lord has avenged you this day of all those who rose against you. See, both the Cushite and Ahamaz are thinking big picture. You were being pursued. There was this attempted overthrow of your reign, and that's done now. But they're forgetting that the reason it's done is because Absalom is dead, and they don't know yet how to tell David this. They're thinking big picture, but David is thinking in very personal terms. What about my son? And so he says the same question. He asks the same question of the Cushite, verse 32. And the king said to the Cushite, is the young man Absalom safe? So the Cushite answered, may the enemies of my lord, the king, and all who rise against you do, to do harm be like that young man. And then David knew. And then the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said thus, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died in your place, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. This is the broken heart of a dad who probably is feeling the guilt of his own past because David knows the reason Absalom is dead is because there was an attempted coup. The reason there was an attempted coup is because there was bitterness between father and son. The reason there was bitterness between father and son is because Absalom took revenge on the rape of his sister Tamar. The reason why that happened is because there was a sword in the family of David. The reason there was a sword in the family of David is because of David's adultery with Bathsheba. David knows that when you trace all of this tragedy back, it ends up at his own feet. So he's brokenhearted on different levels. 
Of course, he's feeling crushed that his son is dead, but he's also crushed that he, and somehow, in some ways, contributed to his own son's death. And so a father with a broken heart, weeping over the loss of his son and over the regret of his own past. We'll pause it for there tonight, and we'll pick it up there next week. Lord, may we learn from this family when we think of the tragedy and the heartache, the death, two of David's sons are dead now. A father's heart broken over the death of his son and his own sin, no doubt, weighing heavy on his heart. A grown man weeping, such tragedy, Lord. May we take to heart these things, may we learn for ourselves, that sin often has consequences that are grievous and hard to bear. So Lord, we pray that you would be merciful and we pray that you would strengthen our hearts that we would not fall into temptation and sin. Lord, help us to guard our own hearts and our own lives to learn from David and his story and his family. And we just thank you for your word, Lord. The parts that encourage us and the parts that warn us. And there's a little of both of that in this chapter tonight. So Lord, minister to our hearts. May we take away what you want us to take away from this chapter tonight and take us home safely and bring us back here on Sunday. We give you praise and thanks together in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. God bless you all.